Welcome back to another romping, stomping, and chomping episode of What Happened, the investigative YouTube-style pop culture media show that shoves its maw deep into the fishy, smelling mounds of developmental turmoil. Now, if you've been living under some type of slime-encrusted rock for the last few months, you'll know that a brand new, totally insane entry in the MonsterVerse series just hit theaters. And if you think that's a flimsy excuse for me to talk about another but unrelated Godzilla thing on this show, it is! So, grab your Wiimotes and prepare to flail yourselves around wildly as I answer the question, what happened to... Godzilla Unleashed. For those that maybe aren't aware, the first two games that Atari aka Infogrames and Pipeworks collaborated on, 2002's Destroy All Monsters Melee and 2004's Save the Earth, were actually pretty big money spinners. This is quite surprising, given that Godzilla was, back then, a strictly straight-to-DVD series, which was largely due to the lackluster response that Godzilla 2000 received during its small theatrical run in North America, but much more largely due to the radioactive fallout from the Roland Emmerich version. He has special needs, that's what they say, he has special needs, Godzilla. Melee sold upwards of 450,000 copies which were largely attributed to the GameCube, while Save the Earth sold a combined 600,000 copies across the PS2 and Xbox. And so, according to longtime Pipeworks employee Simon Strange, pitching for Atari to greenlight a third Godzilla fighter was little more than a formality. Simon was kind enough to speak to me regarding the development of Unleashed, and while the game was a success in some ways, it was uh, less so in critical reception, and by Simon's own admission. The team's immediate instinct was to offer the best lineup of monsters culled from Toho's vast catalog that they could, which Simon confirmed to me was something they absolutely crushed. I really wanted to have a bunch of monsters in it. Despite all the other troubles on Godzilla Unleashed, we said initially, well, we'll have at least 12 monsters because we're building this whole new tech around it and so we might not get as many. So at least 12. We hoped for 16 and then 18 would be good. And then we went all the way up to 26, which would be everything we had ever wanted, right? We hit every single monster we had ever thought about. It was really good. Of those 26 included the lovely Biolante you see here. Pipeworks had actually tried to implement her in the previous game, but didn't have enough time to get her, uh, luxurious carriage to fit within the technical constraints of their engine at that point. Simon Strange also confirmed that several other characters like Monster X, Zilla, King Kong, and others, while fun ideas, were never seriously considered, with no production work done on them at all. There was, however, a lot of work done on the environments, which was led by creative director Mark Crow as a way to shake up the cities that players would eventually be destroying, as two back-to-back -back games that had featured the same types of buildings, cars, and landmarks had gotten a little monotonous. So, they devised a story where giant crystals would alter the Earth's climate dramatically, causing volcanoes to erupt in Seattle and freezing tundras to develop throughout Australia, which promoted lots of exciting visual variety as well as allowing the environment team to go a little nuts. This also played well into the fact that this was the third part in a trilogy and that it represented the biggest Monster Mash seen in a video game up until that point, so raising the stakes seemed pretty appropriate. Fortunately, none of these aspects proved too daunting on a technical level because Pipeworks had gotten extremely familiar with the engine that powered all this madness, as it was a custom-made one that they had developed internally for years. So while development was progressing smoothly, other elements such as the controls were going to have to drastically change and, uh, not necessarily for the better. Another thing that came up pretty early on, and this is, for me, this is the big albatross, but a thing that was decided pretty early on was we wanted something that was a Wii exclusive. The Wii was blowing up huge at the time, and we had done Rampage on the Wii, so we had early alpha kits on the Wiis, and we decided we really wanted a Wii-specific title, and the thing that was decided is that we wanted something that wouldn't work on regular controllers. We were like, it's going to be a Wii game, and to make sure it's 
really a Wii game makes something that literally won't work without a Wii controller. In retrospect, this was a huge mistake. And indeed it was, as this decision would more or less hamstring Godzilla Unleashed from the very get-go. And unfortunately for Pipeworks, it wasn't going to be the only thing either. Before we really dig into some of the other issues that would affect this latest chapter of the King of the Monsters video game career, we do have to touch upon the decision to go all in on those Wii controls because there's definitely more to unpack there. While Pipeworks were pleased that both they and Atari agreed they all wanted to deliver a more ambitious game and thus would plan to release in the second year of the Wii's life cycle instead of rushing it for launch, Simon laments the fact that neither he nor anyone else on the team seemed to second guess going all in on the Wii exclusive controls. It was a flag they had all firmly planted at the very start of development, and when they were in the thick of developing for the Wii in the back half of 2006 and throughout 2007, Nintendo's motion-controlled console was trouncing the competition in units sold, so at the time it was fairly reasonable for developers to want to throw their full weight behind it. But wait, you awful skeleton man, some might be yelling at their screens right now, what about the PS2 version of Unleashed? Well, I was getting to that! As Simon tells it, the original plan was to support the PSP, as it was one of the few platforms that Godzilla had yet to appear on. But since Unleash was being developed with new tech and a dedicated control scheme specifically designed for the Wii, it was decided to port Save the Earth to Sony's handheld, update some of the stages, and simply call it Godzilla Unleashed. This move was publicly announced at the start of 2007, but towards the end of 2007, the PSP version was cancelled and became the PS2 version… Uh, again. Wait, that means because this project was based on Save the Earth, this was the same game! This confusing chain of events did not come from Pipeworks, however, but was a mandate from the top brass at Atari, who, and this is my guess here, were swayed by the much bigger install base of the PS2 and the fact that it was still receiving big releases in 2006 and 2007. So yeah, aside from some stage alterations, Showa-era Gigan, another monster we'll talk about later, and a controllable Batra, it was essentially still Save the Earth, which a contingent of fans were not too enthused over. Simon was pretty clear that this decision was one that was 100% on Atari, as the core staff at Pipeworks were fully focused on the Wii version, and especially on its new, really ambitious feature. Along with the expanded roster, graphical improvements, and the all-new arenas, the team were committed to delivering an expanded story mode that was going to offer fans the most replayability of any campaign in the series at that point. The idea, which was Simon's brainchild, was to group all the monsters into different factions, and when said monsters from said factions win a battle, it affects the story and offers different outcomes. This would have been further altered by the faction you chose on the outset as well, with each day of the story mode being represented by several available missions across the globe that the player could select from. Depending if they won or lost these, different missions would then pop up or old ones would disappear, leading to a lot of possibilities. To make sense of all these warring factions, cutscenes would be needed for context, and with so many variations and story beats going on, using comic book style illustrations would be the most efficient way to render them. According to Simon, however, this proved trickier than they initially thought and actually snowballed into becoming one of Unleashed's bigger issues. We really struggled to find someone to do those comic book panels for us. We didn't have a lot of budget or we faffed about with how long it took and after months we finally agreed on a person and a price. And that person was like, I gave that price three months ago when there was enough time to do it. And now there's not enough time to do it. And so one of our artists said, I'll take it on. I don't know how much I can get done, but I'm just going to work late. I'll do my regular job and stay in the evening and see how many comic book panels I can get through. And he got through 35, and so we had to hack the story to pieces. There was now no setup, but we had the whole 90 story beat thing in and working with the interactive map. It was a production problem, and it was just really frustrating. 
This explains a lot about the campaign's uh, shortcomings, as it reuses many of the same panels over and over again, and while you can lose certain fights, there's no system plugged in to support that outcome, so even when the player is defeated or no winner is declared, you just move on to the next battle without any rhyme or reason to it. Related to that, certain characters and minor plot points are often introduced and just as quickly dropped, a byproduct of the team having to patchwork the storyline together from a much larger tapestry. <sighs> While I'd like to say that this was the end of the snafus to Godzilla Unleashed's development, it sadly wasn't, as a contingent of fans would protest over the inclusion of a particular feature well before the game was ever even released. In February of 2007, a preview for Godzilla Unleashed appeared on IGN, and in it, they revealed that Atari, Pipeworks, and Toho were teaming up to create two all-original monsters that would fit into Unleashed's storyline, and in a roundabout way, officially become a small part of the Toho-verse. Message boards lit up with fans complaining about this inclusion, demanding that these slots be given to the likes of uh, Manda, Gorosaurus, or fucking, I don't know, the, the, the Gargantuas. These protests could rage all they want because one of the monsters had already been fleshed out and approved by Toho, that being Crystalak, a pointy, obviously crystalline fellow who's apparently a spawn of Space Godzilla. Man, I mean, this guy, he's totally giving me vibes. Maybe to quell the dissatisfaction or was planned all along, Simon isn't 100% sure, the second monster was quickly put to an open vote for fans via another IGN article. This vote presented four different designs with the winner going on to make the final roster in the game. Simon Strange recalls this voting procedure being a surprise to everyone at Pipeworks, as they found out the same time that everyone else did. Obsidious won for some reason, I can't tell you why, but I do know that it's wrong. Hashtag justice for Fire Lion, obviously. Anyway, even with the fans having a role in deciding a part of the lineup, there was, and still is, a sentiment shared by some that neither monster really fits alongside the rest of Toho's legendary stable of titans, despite Toho themselves approving both designs. This has remained a sticking point with Godzilla Unleashed ever since, and was an additional factor that didn't really help the situation, especially amongst both fans and critics when the game officially released on December 5th, 2007. Suffice it to say, it was beaten into the ground by critics pretty much everywhere. A 4.9 from IGN, a 3.9 from GameSpot, and a 2 out of 10 from Eurogamer, with the chief complaints being, rather predictably, the controls, with some outlets stating it was nigh unplayable, as well as the brief and very repetitive story campaign. For those that have never had the pleasure, um, the Wii controls of Godzilla Unleashed have players waving the Wii remote and nunchuck around left, right, and center, and it's kind of just a mess. Really, the only actual positive thing you could say here was that at least the Wii game's aggregate scores outpaced those of both the PS2 and the DS versions. Uh, Double Smash is really bad. So, yeah, there's that, I guess. Simon Strange, for his part, owes up to the game's mistakes, saying they mismanaged their time and resources, which led to the numerous problems we just outlined. But even with all those issues, Godzilla wasn't just overflowing with radioactive rage, but with dollar dollar bills. Combined, across all three versions, it managed to sell at least 700,000 copies, according to Simon. This actually makes it the most successful of the Pipeworks trilogy, and as you can imagine, there was a desire to continue the series with another sequel. Unfortunately, one of the linchpins to the Atari slash Godzilla collaboration was a producer by the name of Kirby Fong. Simon explained how Fong was a big kaiju slash tokusatsu fan and was instrumental in pushing these games to green light, but he unfortunately moved on from Atari well before Unleashed came out. 
With no real champion on the publishing side, Pipeworks then moved on to other projects, as well as transitioning from their old outdated engine and on to third-party ones. They now work on the likes of Call of Duty as a support studio, so that kind of explains why a fourth Goji game never came about from this partnership again. There was, of course, the spiritual successor that Simon spearheaded via Kickstarter called Colossal Kaiju Combat that, despite producing a publicly playable build, ran into issues when one of their main staff members, who were among the very few that were adept with the old Godzilla engine, sadly passed away. This left a hole that they were never able to adequately fill before funds had started to dwindle to the point where keeping the project afloat was basically untenable. <sighs> An unfortunate situation all around. Fans have since petitioned and pleaded to both Pipeworks and Atari for some type of sanity in regards to remastering the Godzilla fighting trilogy, but there seems to be less than zero movement on that front. But wait, uh, uh, Atari owns Night Dive. Night Dive remaster real good. Steven Kick so tall and handsome, so yeah, maybe it'll happen someday. I don't know. As for brand new Godzilla games, well, Simon relayed to me that Toho is a very passive company and that other studios need to approach them about the possibility of making projects based on the King of the Monsters. Unfortunately, outside Call of Duty, PUBG, and various indie outfits, it seems there's currently nobody that's willing to take a chance on creating a dedicated big budget game based on the world's most prolific film franchise, which, you know, makes sense because it's not like it's literally at its hottest right now. <laughs> Thanks again so much to Simon Strange for answering all of my questions. If you know of any other monstrous movies or video games with terrifying tales of toil, let me know in the comments below or stomp on through the skyscraper that is my social media. See you next time and thanks for watching!